Welcome to Tea Time, my friends, a place where I muse about my gender transition experience and in the process aim to comfort and inspire others to a greater level of self-awareness. I am Artemis, enjoying a cup of Christmas cake tea, courtesy of the Rosenvine Gift Company, as always. And as of the release of this video in 2022, the label of transgender to describe non-conforming gender expressions, experiences, and identities has exploded. And certainly, throughout history, we have plenty of evidence for the existence of these individuals outside the expected average in these ways. But with the intervention of science and more instantaneous public discourse, I think we are finding that the word transgender is quickly becoming inadequate to describe the intensely nuanced spectrum of experience for those who use the term. Or, at the very least, it seems better to be suited as an umbrella term. Being the stickler that I am for language, in this video I'm going to attempt to break down just how slippery it can get when attempting to use the word to describe gender non-conforming behavior and reported experiences from people who label themselves transgender, and begin to try to navigate the beautiful and extraordinary array of presentation. So, what does it mean to be transgender exactly? At this point, I'm beginning to think that nailing jello to a wall would be an easier task than trying to define it, in part due to the definition depending greatly on which transgender person you're talking to, and the general population's misunderstanding or beliefs about the term in general. For example, some people think that occasional cross-dressing, which is dressing opposite of what is expected of your natal sex based on your culture, qualifies as being transgender. Others still believe that there is no such thing as being transgender because they assume that being transgender means that you have successfully been able to change your natal sex, which of course is impossible and misses all of the nuance of the discussion attempting to be had. All of this is complicated enough without confusing cross-dressing or biological truths about the permanence of sex with what we're coming to understand as a medical condition that can have and often has social influence, both of which I would personally define as being hallmarks of transgenderism. Some have also stated that they believe transgenderism is a phase or a state of being that can be moved out of, such as a child who acts in accordance with the opposite sex throughout their young life, but as adults actually grow out of it. And all of this without mentioning the fact that many people self-diagnose themselves as transgender, speak openly of their label, only then sometime later to discover that it all was a huge misunderstanding with the public relations damage already being done for the condition. You might have woken up from this dream, but the consequences of your actions from within the dream ripple through to the reality of others. So, for the sake of this video, I'm going to have to define a few words to get to defining what transgender is. I've done other videos making the case for a difference between the words sex and gender, but for brevity's sake, I will simply say that gender is not the same as sex. Sex refers simply to one's reproductively based characteristics like chromosomes and genitals. Gender, like sex, is in a binary, and instead of male-female, it is masculine-feminine. Sometimes those characteristics are rooted in the biological differences between the sexes, like, say, the propensity towards physical violence for men. So we would say that physical aggression is a masculine trait, but other times masculine and feminine are socially determined and change with culture and time period. So the argument that gender is a social construct does have some merit, I believe but it isn't as black and white, and it isn't the whole story. Gender does have some social constructs, but it is also influenced by biology. I'm defining here that transgender, as an adjective, means that an individual presents and behaves the majority of the time opposite of what is expected for their natal sex. And that's it. I've intentionally kept this definition vague, and in previous videos, where I have attempted to get more specific, I've realized that less is actually more here, as I'll eventually discuss. Near the end, I will dive into the differences then between transsexual and transgender, because 
it's at this point in our exploration of the experience and the science of gender and sex that I believe it has become important to distinguish them in much greater detail. It's worth noting here that the Oxford Dictionary defines transgender as denoting or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity and gender does not correspond with their birth sex. So the word there is defined by someone's feeling, a sense, they call it, and not anything concretely performative, consistent, measurable, or visible. So according to this definition, transgender could be a fleeting phase and need not require any more than someone stating that they feel they are not normative for society's cultural or social expectations of their birth sex. So this can apply to every tomboy female and emotionally sensitive male out there, kids who feel like they don't fit into the typical heteronormative mold, which are many of them, who never require any treatment at all to live happy and healthy lives. Take that premise and you can understand now why it's a short step away from recommending ill-advised hormone treatments and surgeries in order to supposedly correct this faux sense of misalignment, ironically created by social construct, and how transgender males to females try to claim the term woman by saying that they simply feel like a woman and should be allowed into women's spaces. Now. Transgender can be used as an adjective or a noun, though at current the Oxford Dictionary recognizes only the adjective form, but the difference between using it as an adjective or a noun allows for more informational room with such a vaguely defined word. As a noun, to say that someone is a transgender would mean that with a simple visual observation, some basic questions about their life and the knowledge of that person's natal sex you could see that the person was presenting purposefully as to be expected of the opposite sex. So, for example, a butch lesbian who regularly presents in many ways as what would be typical of a male, such as clothing choice and communication style, under this definition would qualify as a transgender. That may sound strange to many, and certainly I acknowledge that there are many butch lesbians who would not identify themselves as transgender in this way. But it's important to recognize that definitions need not consider anyone's feelings. Very important to realize that. In fact, it's in trying to change definitions of words based on subjective feelings that get us tied up in these knots focusing more on assuaging our own hang-ups rather than being objectively correct and keeping things clear. We lose the actual definition of the word because we replace it with how we've seen others in our experience use it or associate with it or how they feel about the word or the feelings associated with it. This said butch lesbian would not have to feel like they fit the definition for it actually to be true. And perhaps calling something like it is, despite the feelings around it, allows for a breakthrough of understanding and consistent messaging. Furthermore, but just as crucial to consider, we tend to think of some nouns as powerful, standalone identities with breadth of their own. And in that way, it can become very difficult for people to think objectively about them. We protect those nouns as though they were living and imbued with a sense of untouchable power. And when we graft our own identity within it, we protect them as if our lives depend on it. I did a video about this very psychological mechanism in The Psychology of Being Offended. If you'd like a tangential exploration on this, link above. Okay, so back to our revisit of parts of speech dissection, which I'm sure was an absolutely thrilling topic for everyone in school. Transgender as an adjective would mean any behavior or modification isolated on its own that is performed or seen that is opposite to what would be expected of the corresponding natal sex, stopping short of hard medical intervention. Therefore, Binding breasts for a flatter chest on a female is a transgender practice, as well as the tucking of a penis on a male. The natural display of breasts on a female is a feminine characteristic, 
and the natural display of a penis is a masculine characteristic, meaning that an attempt to hide either in deviating from the default for that sex is a transgender practice. This is an example of where sex and gender overlap a bit as well. However, if an attempt were made to remove either through the permanence of surgery, this becomes a transsexual practice, a practice being the key word here, because the individual is making attempts to realign aspects of their sex with the default of the opposite to which they were born. But this does not necessarily make someone a transsexual, which I will talk about near the end of this video. It may seem like I'm splitting hairs here, but I firmly believe that it's this lack of attention to linguistic detail that leaves room for argument about definitions and subsequently creates such confusion and difficulty in arriving at understanding and compromise in conversations. For perhaps a clearer example of transgender being used as an adjective to describe behavior, the acceptance of the usage of a pronoun opposite their birth sex because they pass societally as the opposite sex would be considered transgender behavior. In other words, if you have a penis and you get called she because you look mostly like a female, aka Blair White, this is transgender behavior. The fact that Blair White had a breast augmentation is a transsexual practice. You could also say that much of the transgender experience is also just gender non-conforming behavior, simply more consistent in expression and pervasive across many aspects of somebody's life. Now, the reason why someone may wish to be seen as the opposite sex in society through the hiding of genitals or secondary sex characteristics or any other practice is a very important concept for each individual experiencing these things to understand for themselves, as they can be rooted in psychological trauma or lack of self-awareness, which are the very foundations that lead to many detransitioning stories. However, I believe that for some, the inspiration for these transgender behaviors stems from a biological root that is wired in the womb. So let's follow that rabbit hole for a little bit. We are still on the frontier of understanding the exact mechanisms behind the vast array of experiences that we can categorize under the term transgender. And that is to assume that someone's expression of their feelings is something that we can even go on as factual evidence. As we discussed earlier with the subjective feelings-based Oxford Dictionary definition of transgender, it gets extremely messy very quickly. From a science perspective, just because someone says that they feel a certain way, this is not in and of itself enough evidence to support a biological root for transgenderism. As we've experienced, feelings can change all the time. And the reasoning for those feelings can range from psychological trauma to cultural conditioning to actual chemical imbalances within the body. More recently though, with brain scan studies and reported mental health improvement of those on long-term hormone replacement therapy versus those who experience negative effects on hormone replacement therapy with cross-sex hormones, we are seeing a small light shown on there being scientific proof for the root of these feelings, lending evidence to the claim that transgenderism and transsexuality for some people, for some people, can have a biological root that was inherited at birth. Still, within this category of people for whom cross-sex hormones and surgeries actually benefit in a long-term way, there is an impressive array in the way in which this is experienced. For example, you have individuals claiming from a young age and consistently through adolescence and into adulthood that they feel they have been born in the wrong body and are not the sex they should be. These individuals tend to experience great relief when given cross-sex hormones and take other steps to cosmetically change their bodies to align with such due to varying degrees of discomfort with their physical sexual characteristics. Then you have someone like myself who did not believe from childhood that I was born in the wrong body. I behaved and presented in many ways as unexpected for my sex, but was not plagued with a consistent pain of being mismatched. Instead, I did not transition until I was 31 after getting to know myself and when my brain maturation was complete. 
I had decided to try cross-sex hormones because I wanted to see if they would improve my overall mental health and functioning, and it did. Still, three years, almost four years on at the recording of this video. If it had not, I was well aware of the irreversible side effects of testosterone and even wanted those changes and would have stopped the medication if my mental or physical health deteriorated. I also decided on a double mastectomy simply because I cosmetically detested my feminine breasts and they were as useful to me as a chocolate teapot. These two experiences of transgenderism are very, very different, but still have the same end result. People who present to the world consistently that they are opposite the sex or gender that they were born. However, one important thing to note between these two vastly different experiences is that none of us believe that we actually are the opposite sex, which is a very important distinction to make because this then distinguishes us as being capable of reason and being grounded in reality, something that is absent in mental illnesses and disorders where the individual is non-functioning in society. Often, I feel there is a stigma attached to transgender and transsexual individuals because there is an assumption that we believe in a delusion. Despite evidence for our natal condition being readily observable, which is understandable. I mean, I would have a hard time being comfortable with or trusting someone who insisted that they were a unicorn despite looking like a bipedal naked mole rat with a mullet, right? That being said, that's a decent segue into all of the mistaken labeling of transgenderism, which is what happens when someone has not had proper therapy and believes that transitioning will fix their feelings, when their feelings are not rooted in a medical condition. An example of this would be a young boy raised by a misandric mother, consistently degrading masculinity to the point that the child grows up wishing to be female. Parental influence is massive to a child's development, and by evolutionary standards it has to be because we are so helpless for at least the first decade of our lives that we must take our elders' influence as gospel for survival. It's also why we tend to repeat our parents' relationships with our own often unconsciously, and why those without conscience that wish to make their dogma pervasive prefer to groom children instead of adults. Another misled youth example is a biological female who was sexually violated at a young age, who comes to see her sex as the reason she was preyed upon and then internalizes a hatred for that aspect of herself, then transitioning in order to perceive a sense of safety instead of recognizing that her sex is not the problem or the area needing to be changed. This happens with sexually traumatized women and feeling a sense of safety in being overweight as well, just as a note of connection. Then there are those that attempt to transition because they are looking to attract what they think they want in a romantic partner. This would be everything from women who watch yaoi anime wishing to bed gay men for the sensual allure, thinking that surface transitioning to male would be enough to achieve their interest, to men who are naturally feminine thinking that they will not be attractive to a heterosexual woman due to cultural expectations, so they attempt to transition in order to be more attractive to lesbians or even simply to justify their feminine nature. In both of those cases, there is a very sad misunderstanding about sexuality, which is that it often is based in attraction to certain genitalia, hence the super straight movement, by the way, and genital reconstructive procedures are far from perfected in sexual reassignment surgery and often still not acceptable to those partners they are trying to attract. Not to mention, in this realm of misdiagnosed transgenderism, there is a foundational flaw to the choice to pursue transitioning. The choice to transition was made while they believed that their happiness and mental health were someone else's responsibility and not their own. As in, often relationships fail because we make the other person responsible for our core happiness instead of ensuring that within ourselves and then coming to the relationship to give. All of these individuals may claim that they are transgender for a period of time because they believe that something associated with their sex is the problem, rather than realizing that it's an issue with the way they think about things, in my opinion. 
I believe that the perfect storm we are now in is that one, we have such a broad definition of gender, which is either of the two sexes, male and female, especially when considered with reference to social and cultural differences rather than biological ones, lending to confusion about where someone's problem actually resides, and two, a medical field that is quick to diagnose a disorder instead of investigate the issue with therapy in favor of defining compassion as affirming one's feelings and we are billing ourselves as evolved because we stay we strive for compassion and three broadly applying the notion and spreading the belief that one can be born in the wrong body to a large group of people when there are in actuality very very few people for whom this phenomena is genuinely experienced and i as a considered transgender person am not even one of those this makes it so that an underinformed individual left unchecked by objective therapy can pin their problems on a seemingly simple solution that they were simply born in the wrong body and that this is somehow fixable with hormones and surgeries when you can never actually get a different body because gender has societal and cultural influence to some degree Many people are choosing medical intervention for what is actually a problem of logic or thought. And it's easy to see why when gender and sex are often conflated where they are distinct from one another. This is part of what makes it so hard for many people to define transgenderism because many people are confusing their experiences with gender nonconformity, which is largely a social issue with the need to change physical things about themselves and co-opting the term transgender to mean that there is something wrong with them that needs medical intervention. We're going to talk about gender nonconformity in just a minute as well as later talk about the rise of the use of the term transsexual to differentiate the trans experience more. But first, let's try to nail this jello to the wall some more and really get into the nitty-gritty about the medicalized condition of transgenderism or at the very least introduce some new points to consider in pondering this field do we really know what we think we know as factual transgenderism when people cannot pinpoint the source of their feelings much less determine if those are healthy foundations from which to build how do we know that every individual claiming from a young age that they were in the wrong body did not get some kind of parental influence or pharmaceutical contamination? Certainly, someone with the experience of transgenderism like myself has a number of societal, cultural, and cognitive biases that led ultimately to the decision to transition aspects of my body and social experience. So. How much of that really is biological influence? As in, in a vacuum of influence, would I still have wanted a double mastectomy and to attempt hormone replacement therapy? How much of the experience of transgenderism is inseparably tied to the socio-cultural conditions in which we live? because those are inevitable with life, and how much could we attribute strictly to biological wiring? While some transgenderism manifestations may be largely a wiring issue, perhaps like the child who feels they were born in the wrong body, those on the fringes like myself could be influenced largely by our cultural expressions and expectations of men and women, while still helped by hormones and surgeries, perhaps to a lesser degree. What I'm left with at the end of the day is hard evidence from the biological root of transgenderism is the fact that in a long-term way, cross-sex hormones for a transgender individual do improve mental health and quality of life. And that is something that cannot be explained with social, cultural, or cognitive influence. At least at this moment in time, I believe that to be so. Outside of this, we could be simultaneously in a large number of cases creating social conditions to make transitioning more appealing. As in, we are creating part of the problem. 
For example, if as a society we created more appreciation and love of gender non-conforming individuals, as well as work to diminish unhealthy forms of objectification or discrimination without using tyranny, force, and acted out hate, how many people would forego an attempt at hormones or surgery, thus perhaps never identifying with medicalized transgenderism? Certainly there is something to be said also about being compassionate and aware of our innate tendencies like natural sex drives and bodily attraction where objectification of others occurs. It's just often these things are not in balance with being empathetic of others. Today, for better or worse, there is currently increased access to and lower barrier to entry for medicalizing transgenderism with hormone replacement therapy and surgeries. At this point, we have distinguished the transgender individual who feels like they were born in the wrong body from individuals such as myself with a more gradual awareness of gender identity. Each have distinctly different pathologies, and I want to focus on the latter for a bit with this question. What's the line between the super masculine woman or the super feminine man and a trans person who pursues hormones and surgery? Is the availability of medical intervention allowing more of these individuals on the fringe, i.e. a super masculine woman or a super feminine man, to tweak their experience just a little more for their benefit. Pause on that pondering for just a moment. So far, we haven't talked about the terms gender dysphoria and gender identity disorder, which are both conditions that are typically associated with someone who identifies as being transgender. In some cases, they are considered terms for the same thing, but I think there is nuance to parse here that is important to further flesh out the experience of transgenderism. Gender dysphoria is the feeling of discomfort or distress that might occur in people whose gender build, which is their unique combination of masculine and feminine traits, differs from what is average of their sex at birth or sex-related physical characteristics. In this definition of gender, it is differentiated from sex, even though in the past both gender and sex were used interchangeably as the same thing. I made a video, link above, um, attempting to give a better definition for gender, which I believe is different from sex, as sex is defined as the chromosomal and genital differences between biological males and females. Gender refers more to characteristics of masculine and feminine, which can both be biologically based, as in the different ways men and women tend to use their brains, and also culturally defined, as in what is socially expected of men and women. In this way, gender is a much more complex expression than the typically distinct and simple categories of male and female. Ironically though, gender expectations, while often subjective and socially and culturally created, are still rooted in what is biologically natural or tendencies within each of the sexes, as in, a love of shopping is considered feminine and is rooted in the evolutionary expectation of females to be gatherers and the act of hunting and killing foods tend to be a masculine trait because it was typically performed by males due to its danger and greater physical demands. I think when some people try to say that gender is a social construct, it would behoove them at least to say also that what they mean is that they believe sex and gender to be different from one another which not all people yet understand, but we won't split more hairs on that in this video. So, gender dysphoria to me would mean that someone experiences discomfort in their identification with gender characteristics that are opposite of what would be expected for their natal sex. For instance, a very feminine man, both in his physical form and emotional expression, who feels uncomfortable because he is expected to be more muscle-bound and less emotionally sensitive. A man like this might be very tempted to transition to what would be perceived by society as a woman because he thinks he would experience more belonging and less challenge on a daily basis to who he naturally is. This is one of those situations where more societal acceptance and celebration of the strengths and contributions of individuals like that might reveal that they are simply gender non-conforming and medicalization is not the right choice for them. 
In this case, the dysphoria or the discomfort with gender is almost entirely a result of social influence and disharmony. Gender dysphoria is something that many youth especially experience and often passes once they mature. Perhaps many of us can even remember feeling extremely awkward at puberty and not knowing what to do or think about the changes we were experiencing, trying to figure out where we fit in. This quick rush to medicalization this quick rush to medicalize these conditions and attempt to rectify it with irreversible treatments is producing many stories of detransitioners. People who followed the urge from the affirmational model in the so-called mental health community in the surgical realm and realized after some time that what they thought was transgenderism was simply just an underdeveloped sense of self, childhood baggage, or illogical problem solving. Those with gender identity disorder, however, focus specifically on sex-related characteristics like genitalia and secondary sex characteristics like facial hair, pitch of voice, and bone structure, and attempt to align themselves opposite to what they were born. When someone is given a diagnosis in order to receive hormone replacement therapy or a WPATH letter for surgeries, the DSM-5 labels this gender identity disorder. And it is my understanding that the terms sex and gender are used interchangeably here. Based on what I've previously given as reason for defining gender differently than sex, I would personally advocate for this condition of focusing dissatisfaction with one's sex to be called sexual identity disorder to keep these different experiences of transgenderism and transsexuality more clearly defined. For those with what I would call the most classic cases of transsexuality, they insist from a young age that they were born in the wrong body and when they are legally capable, pursue as many changes as they can to align themselves with the sex they feel that they are and are greatly helped by this treatment. These individuals would then be considered transsexuals, a step further than a transgender individual because they've made medicalized changes to sex markers. However, there are many youth who feel quite alienated by puberty and experience this genital or body dysphoria when their physical sexual characteristics develop only to eventually grow out of this phase and be perfectly functioning and happy reproductive adults. I mean, even today, I have talked to many biological females who would rid themselves of their breasts if their partner didn't insist on their presence and who happily see themselves still as women, breasts or no breasts. The current activist push is to rush medical treatment of this fairly common awkward phase in order to catch the less than 1% of children who would actually benefit to some degree from this early intervention. And while someday I hope that science finds a way to identify the child with a biological signature that ensures the diagnosis was correct, at current we do not have this and are seeing many more children harmed by this move which is falsely presented as pure empathy. If a fully mature adult of 25 plus of years of age decides to try to make those changes, as long as they were presented with at least some opportunity for personal reflection and objective input, I'm all for freedom of choice at this point. But the vast majority of children are incapable of this kind of reasoning. So to the question I posed a little bit ago, what's the line between a super masculine woman or super feminine man and a healthy transgender person? Well, on one end of the transgender spectrum, it means someone who specifically pursues hormones and genital reconstructive surgery because they have a strong belief that they were born in the wrong body and their dysphoria is so great that without intervention in this way, their quality of life would be so poor that they were not functioning. On the other, it means someone who still benefits from the effects of cross-sex hormones and certain cosmetic surgeries just not necessarily in pursuit of trying to be as much of the opposite sex as possible and more about finding the best combination of treatments to maximize their highest potentials. As I've said before, two different pathologies, same end result. This is why good mental therapy and time for maturation and reflection are vital and why it's so easy to get a wrong diagnosis and treatment plan. 
Also, children can be very insistent that they wish they were the opposite sex and end up growing out of this, too, unbeknownst to us as to why that happens. If one is convinced that they were born in the wrong body instead of evaluating hormones and surgery at each step and attempts simply to check off all the boxes to complete a transition, they often end up with far more changes than best suits their individual needs. Oftentimes as well, people will feel the need to make a quote unquote complete and total transition in order to fit in with what they think society's expectations are. And again, this lack of appreciation for gender non-conforming individuals can produce someone who undergoes more treatment than is actually healthy for them. For people like myself, because I transitioned in my early 30s, I already had a sense of confidence in who I was, did not seek validation from anyone, and took the time to step into transitioning gradually until I reached a point where I was personally comfortable and benefiting from hormones as a medical supplement. The biggest biological green light for me was a whole year on testosterone and feeling mentally fantastic, at which point I was given a WPATH letter in support of a double mastectomy. I had always hated my breasts anyway, but especially if I was going to be read as male in my healthiest form, I definitely needed and wanted to get rid of the sweater puppies. So here's a brain worm of a question. If society didn't have a problem with male presenting individuals having breasts, would I still have had the top surgery? For me, I believe more than likely I would have because they just felt like giant ugly skin tags on me and with my choice not to have children it just seemed reasonable. But I cannot answer that question for other people and it's possible that without that societal feedback some testosterone taking females might not be bothered enough to have surgery or just choose to bind their breasts. In any case, my takeaway here is that some of the transgenderism may be influenced by societal feedback and choices made to ease operation in social life. But it's important to realize where the line is between a choice made to benefit your own personal health and one for conditions outside of yourself. I did a video exploring this too, link above that we might be approaching transgender medicine backwards if you'd like more thoughts on that. And there's something more to be said too about some of the physical interventions transgender individuals pursue in order to quote unquote look like the opposite sex. While we have others who simply inhabit a gender non-conforming look without feeling the need to alter themselves in any way or feeling like they should have been the opposite sex. And this is a curious thing to consider. For example, there are very masculinely presenting women who still prefer to be called ma'am to acknowledge their biological sex or feminine presenting men who very much enjoy the fact that they have a penis, a very distinctly male marker, and do not try to tuck it out of existence like a wayward flyaway. It also seems that having their desired sex reflected back to them by society is important or else their extreme measures to blend in would not be necessary and they could choose to present in a more androgynous fashion. In order for a transgender person to get the societal feedback they want in being perceived as the opposite sex though, it seems to me that they do not choose to pursue bottom surgeries they often ironically caricature the most stereotypical expectations of their transitioned gender, despite having completed hormone treatments and other surgeries. So for trans women, they'll wear lots of makeup, long hair, revealing clothing, and for trans men, they'll grow facial hair, bulk up muscle, and wear power cut clothes. It's as if in a way, to offset their lack of the natural sex and genitals that they desire, they perform stereotypes of that sex that even a natural male or female sometimes chooses not to. To channel some Freud here, to me, this indicates potentially a fixation on the lack of desired genitals, which could very well have a biological root within the brain and results in other ways of compensating or else the performative stereotypes of sex and gender may not be necessary for them. Is it possible that these individuals are seeking the external validation from others about their desired sex when they present in caricature? Or 
do they innately enjoy the presentations of extreme masculinity or femininity? If they weren't bumping up against society all the time, reading them a certain way, or if they could just learn not to care, how much would they truly be bothered by their natal sex, i.e. just how much of this disorder is truly a brain wiring misalignment in combination with some other factors? And I'm asking this pick apart question because it has been hypothesized and tried before to use psychotherapy to cure sexual identity disorder. And while it may be helpful to some degree for some people, I think the model has gone by the baby with the bathwater analogy instead of keeping it within the toolbox where I believe it still belongs. Just because for some people it didn't work or helped only very little, it doesn't mean it's overall useless. Now, with all the smoothness of a wooden roller coaster, let's turn our attention briefly to another microcosm that is the uniquely female to male experience of having many more body and face changes on testosterone than male to females experience with feminizing hormone treatment. For trans men whose transitions are sustained happy ones, do they innately enjoy the superficial secondary sex characteristics like having facial hair, deeper voices, more muscle, or is it more the societal feedback they get by being red male that they are enjoying? Or do they not care about any of that and simply feel mentally happier from the effects of the hormone? For me personally, the, the answer to those questions is that I love how my voice feels within my chest now. It's a type of vibrational therapy that when I speak with purpose, it quite literally feels like it resonates with me on a frequency more akin to who I believe I am at a soul level. I did not have that with my voice pre-testosterone and there's definitely something to be said about the power of voice in healing. Just ask any practiced meditator or sound healer. I love what little Cheeto dust of facial hair I do have and look forward to having more and being able to express myself grooming in that way as well as the idea of just being furrier in general. And nope, this is not the same thing as being a furry. I'm going to leave that one way over there. I also love having lean muscle, no breasts, and none of this has anything to do with me wanting people to perceive me a certain gender. It's just something I enjoy for myself. Could I live without facial hair, a deeper voice, lean muscle, and kept my breasts? Yeah. Has my life improved measurably with only the internal effects that testosterone has caused me, absent of any societal feedback? Absolutely. The choices I made were not because I actively aimed or wanted to be more male, but in the pursuit of what felt more comfortable to me, the secondary consequence was that my outward expression to the world was read as male, which to me is nearly inconsequential. So to whip our roller coaster back to the trans people performing extreme caricature stereotypes. If fixation on natal sex and getting societal validation were not so important, instead you could end up with a trans person who looks somewhat androgynous and who is happy with minimally invasive interventions. Let me say too that I fully recognize that there are many places in the world still that do not accept people who are gender non-conforming. So blending in in whatever way possible is necessary to avoid potential violence or even being criminalized. If we were to take away that threat, and we have in many other developed areas of the world, this could give us better insight into what the drivers are for those choices in behavior and presentation. And I would be greatly appreciative of anecdotal comments below, either proving or disproving this observation and any of the other questions that I've posited to this point. Currently, all I have to go on are transgender individuals in media spotlight and my own experience, which I'll admit is definitely a very poor scientific sample size. 
in the end, I believe that there is a biological component to this desire to be the opposite sex, which differentiates the medicalized trans person from the cis sex person who is just gender non-conforming, or else something like cross-dressing would alleviate the symptoms. And since we are on the frontier of understanding this field of transgenderism and transsexuality from a scientific standpoint, there is also this lingering and mounting evidence that there are some people who respond mentally very well to hormone replacement therapy with cross-sex hormones. In contrast to those that think they are transgender, start hormones, and realize that their mental health actually deteriorates. I would term the first phenomena physiochemical sex misalignment to mean that one has physiological wiring, typically in the brain, that responds to chemicals that are somewhat more sex-based, like testosterone and estrogen, and this does not always line up with what one's genital sex is. In this case of a certain level of transgender person, their physiochemical sex is opposite of what their genitals are. It would be a biological female who responds better to higher levels of testosterone and a biological male who responds better to higher levels of feminizing hormones. This is keeping in mind that we know both sexes have mostly the same hormones, just in different levels. This would lend credence to the claim that gender is based more in the brain while sex is more about the reproductive parts. I say, though, that they respond well mentally because physically, unfortunately, many trans people end up needing additional treatments elsewhere in their bodies for the effects those hormone treatments have, like trans men opting for hysterectomies to address the atrophy that testosterone causes. On this leading edge, though, medicine is developing more and more to fine-tune the treatments that are given instead of broad spectrum or harsh treatments like the slice and dice. Plus, there is always the opportunity for each individual person to do a benefit-cost analysis and decide which is the greater priority with what is available to them at current. This seemingly damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario has led many people to wondering if there's much good to be done with the treatments available or even if there is validity to a trans person's claims to justify medical experimentation and intervention, because that's what a lot of this is. It is medical experimentation. But I would say that every adult has free will to be able to research and choose, and consequences are part of life and learning. One more pondering to add to this idea of physiochemical sex. I have a trans woman who adds wonderful thoughts on the channel in the comment section of my videos, and she brought up a point that got me to thinking about the boundaries between men and women and how we define them. She was saying that being on supplemental testosterone in an early attempt to fix her feelings of misalignment led her to feeling more inclined to exit the game of life, so to speak. And now, while on feminizing hormones as a biological male, those feelings went away for her. Her reasoning was that she probably has more estrogen receptors in her body than for testosterone, to put it simply. And if that's even how it works exactly, Therefore, she reasoned that she was a woman trapped in a male's body. And to be clear, she used the term woman instead of female. It seems to me that this may be one way we can define woman, which can be slightly different from female. One definition of woman being that you have more physiochemical receptors for feminizing hormones than you do testosterone and female referring to genitals specific to the carrying and birthing of offspring. I carefully say that we may be able to include a wider definition for women in this way so as not to include those individuals who simply say they feel like they are a woman, but do almost nothing or just surface caricature to be able to co-opt that label, which has led to a lot of violation of female-only spaces but we won't touch on that nuclear hot potato in this video. Here's where that more inclusive definition of woman that I just mentioned gets a little tricky. If to be included in this category as a biological male, you must have predominantly more feminizing hormone receptors in your body, 
At which point or how many do you need before you've crossed that line and are physiochemically a different sex than your genitals would say that you are? I could argue for myself that I have a physiochemical sex that is male because I experience great benefit mentally from being on testosterone, but I never considered myself a male trapped in a female's body, nor did I ever consider taking a dive in the daisies due to my discomfort. There is something distinctly different between my experience and that of the previously mentioned trans woman. Both of them real and valid, in my opinion, and yet we both benefit from cross-sex hormones. The answer to where that line resides between woman and man in that strictly hormonal sense is the same answer to the abortion debate question of when is a fetus a human? The closer you get to defining it, the further to infinity it goes to such the point that it becomes impossible, at least with current technology, to pinpoint an exact answer. And even if you could, would such a detail even be equally consciously perceived by the individuals with those physiochemical makeups? As in, you can have genetic coding that never gets to the level of consciousness or even expression that can be seen for it to have any effect in your waking life. As we discussed earlier this century when this video began, feelings are a funny thing that don't exactly have a defined science to them and are highly subjective. It would seem here at least that the line between man and woman can get really fuzzy. And this blurred boundary is what allows both fascinating inquiry and insight as well as slippery slope manifestations. And while we're drawing lines here, it becomes necessary to define the boundaries between the terms transsexual and transgender. This video has largely been about trying to define what transgender even is, mostly due to the explosion and those trying to identify as such and having a messy finger painting time of it. But now in an effort to differentiate experiences, there are prominent individuals who previously identified as transgender who are now identifying as transsexual. On first blush, I think it's great that we have the space and the luxury to explore these topics and more thoroughly define words for our richer experiences. And on the other, being the purist I am for language, I see a big problem with this word choice. I do not think it is possible for anyone to actually be a transsexual. The word implies that you have transitioned sexes, which literally cannot be done, at least not yet and not for the foreseeable future. When people say that someone cannot be transgender because it is impossible to change sexes, they are conflating the words sex and gender because for a long time they were taught as the same thing but they are not synonyms. The only thing that is being done with a transgender person is that they are appearing as the opposite sex, which falls more into the category of how we have defined gender, something that is partially biological in nature, like hormones and brain activity, and equally socially or culturally constructed. I understand why transsexual is being used to define those who perform in many ways as the opposite sex, to which they were born, but it still is not accurate. Inherent in that usage is that biological sex, as it is medically and scientifically defined, is negotiable, which it's not. To me, it seems that this relabeling is more of a knee-jerk response by the quote-unquote old-school transgender people who, instead of more thoroughly fleshing out the label that they had, simply abandoned ship for something that seemed crisper. And perhaps it's even being done in a desperate attempt to distance themselves from radical activists and those that are simply unwell representing a community that they are seen a part of. And I can understand that entirely. In reality though, anything that starts on a weak foundation will ultimately end up falling too. And using the term transsexual actually violates many of their own beliefs that when they transition, they know and must negotiate with the fact that they will never be the opposite sex. Despite the truth being that changing sexes is not actually possible, I still think there is a use for the word transsexual, and I would define it as having two different definitions. One based on it as a noun, and the other as an adjective, just as we did before when defining transgender. 
I would define transsexual as a noun to mean someone who pursues as many medical avenues as is possible with the intent to achieve as much alignment as they can with the opposite sex to which they were born. Because these individuals have a DSM-like pathology of truly feeling like they are not the correct sex, which is a belief that emerges in the earliest years of their life seemingly independent of social influence. Transsexual as an adjective would mean any bodily modification in and of itself that aims to change a primary or secondary sex characteristic to that of the default of the opposite sex. So to use myself as an example, I am a transgender individual who presents as what is expected of a male despite being a biological female and I have completed transsexual procedures such as hormone replacement therapy and a double mastectomy. I am not, however, a transsexual because I do not intend to complete more procedures below the belt. And neither am I attempting to completely align myself with the opposite sex due to a belief that I was born an incorrect sex. I have heard popular trans people talk about not getting bottom surgeries because at current, they are very risky procedures with a low success rate, but if they also do not want those surgeries because they are unhappy enough with their nether regions, then they too are not transsexuals, but instead are transgender individuals who have gotten some transsexual modifications. I believe transgender is still the best term we have at present to describe most gender non-conforming behavior, with transsexual being used to parse intent as well as describe certain medical procedures, and perhaps someday we will come up with a range of terms to describe the major categories of experiences within it, should that even be a desired pursuit. Transgender, as we have come to see it, can really be an umbrella term, and when used, it becomes the responsibility of the speaker choosing to identify themselves in this way to define what they mean to their audience. Now, here's something to chew on. If sex comes to be defined by more facets, like the term physiochemical sex that I proposed earlier, or there actually is discovered a measurable brain sex, then transsexual may be used perhaps in a different dimension. But for now, as sex is defined, transgender is a better term at its core meaning to describe what we are seeing in people like Blair White and Buck Angel, in my opinion. Most of the time, you aren't having these incredibly intimate conversations anyway, because day to day we live in what Jordan Peterson has called a low resolution world, where the complexity of things is hardly addressed, but if you're going to engage on that level with the world or others, be thorough and honest. That's the best you can do, in my opinion. For now, how I experience transgenderism is not about feeling as though I was born in the wrong body. At first, as I was exploring the topic before my transition, I came upon the idea of identity being dominated by either male or female, and this could be either right or wrong for you. Even though I was not conscientious of this at a young age, like some transgender people are, I saw how easy it would be to be convinced of a truth that your sex is mismatched to the rest of you. I thought like an average man, I worked like an average man, I spoke like an average man, I problem solved like an average man. I focused on certain things like an average man, what I wanted out of life was like that of an average man. My sexual behavior in a lot of ways was like that of an average man. And almost nothing within me resonated on a mental or physical level with that which was expected of or experienced by the average woman. All of that observation made it very tempting to believe that I was a man in the brain and I would just flow better if I were a man on the outside too. Given that I was contemplating all of this at the age of 30, however, I was able to look at it very logically and realize that trying to simply physically change my outside with the sole purpose of aligning my sex was a fruitless endeavor and instead began to pick apart each individual piece in transitioning to see what would create an optimized experience for me. 
I talk about this in my video on a different approach to treating transgenderism, link above if you're interested. I was already wearing men's clothes and after careful consideration went on testosterone. This worked out wonderfully for me and since I really hated the look and feel of my breasts, I had a double mastectomy after one year on T, as I said before. Since I do not have such horrible dysphoria about my lower half and because the surgeries are prohibitive in more ways than one, I am happy with where I am now. The outside world reads me as male, but this is unimportant to me. I do not need the societal feedback of being gendered by strangers as a man. I can understand that constant societal reminders of your sex get tiresome in many ways if you don't feel like the sex that you are. And isolation is often a harmful coping mechanism, but I believe that if people were able to be less focused on the feedback of others as a condition to their happiness, it would alleviate a portion of their dysphoria. To realize that the outside world is reading only surface level secondary sex characteristics, and this has little to nothing to do with you as a complex individual, may be very healing and relieving to know indeed. You know who you are. Be confident in that, despite how it looks, without forcing others to accept it. That's the ultimate level of personal emotional mastery, in my opinion. This snap judgment of sex that other people are making is divorced from deep meaning and as such is no identity on which to hang your value. We have exploded in the potentials of what each unique individual has to offer in this now abundant world. In many places, we are no longer focused on survival and the need to judge people on this surface level in order just to keep existing. We are moving beyond the need for differentiating the sexes based on survival and reproductive potential and can appreciate gender non-conforming or atypical individuals for what they can bring to society now that they are abundantly living. I do not define myself by my sex. I simply recognize that it is the fact of my biology. Instead, I am a nuanced collection of masculine and feminine traits, and my combination only seems atypical in the context of a society and culture informed by evolutionary biology, which is survival-driven, focused on reproduction, and not meant for nurturing diversity. As long as we harbor the cognitive bias in our subconscious that our focus should be reproduction and survival, we will struggle to accept the benefits that gender non-conforming people can offer. I can forgive anyone who doesn't understand this and aim only to find therapies that bring me to center within myself so that I may offer my best to the world. This is one area where I believe spirituality has a lot to offer in calming the anxiety of beings like us who are conscientious of our own mortality. As humans, we occupy this space that seemingly other animals do not, and that is being aware of ourselves and our eventual bodily death. Otherwise, life would be lived quite in the moment with little forward-thinking strategy or concern. And with that awareness, we also wonder who we are. In the context of the sex and gender discussion, we seem keen to define the differences between us, which really is a very nifty feature of discernment, which opens up a whole world of possibilities. In the hermetic principles of masculine and feminine as genders and not sexes, it is taught that everyone has both masculine and feminine within them. And in the spiritualities based off of this, there's a belief that Metaphysically, we are all pieces of source energy, which is both male and female, masculine and feminine. Just because we may have one set of characteristics in heavier number than another does not mean that we must align our bodies to fit the characteristic sex from which we associate those traits. Again, an appreciation of gender non-conforming people would go a long way, I believe, to both preventing misguided transitioning and help to soothe those with genuine dysphorias. What we have here in this dimensional reality that we perceive is simply a combination of characteristics to include sex and gender characteristics to facilitate learning in a particular way, but in the end is not actually who we are. Just a role that we play and a costume that we've done to do so, I believe. To transcend gender altogether may be one of the highest forms of enlightenment or realization. 
maybe, the genderless, self-proclaimed non-binary people are onto this concept, even though their flip-flopping execution is a poor translation of the core essence of the Hermetic Principle, the idea being that everyone is a combination of masculine and feminine and no one is strictly either or. Simply acknowledging that you have a very real biological sex does not define your spiritual or emotional self or box you into a core sex-determined identity. And speaking of boxes, I have a note for personal insight on self-love. There may be people who watch this video and feel challenged or upset that by the definitions I have set out, they no longer fit the boxes of transgender or transsexual in which they had placed themselves. These may be the same people who end up detransitioning after undergoing irreversible medical procedures. Those thinking that they need surgery or hormones when they are simply gender non-conforming or that they currently believe their problems are rooted in a gender identity issue and are simply misguided. Those individuals are likely wanting inclusion, upset by my proposed definitions and are looking for something to diagnose within themselves in order to feel like they have put a label on why they feel so uncomfortable within their lives because not fitting in has been painful for them. I think a great many people can relate to that. I would think that one would be grateful to come to the understanding that they do not need surgery or medication the rest of their lives and that their problem perhaps could be fixed by some emotional therapy or just a foundational confidence in themselves but often they fight for inclusion into a group instead, even if they do not fit the box, terrified of being cast out. I think that speaks to the nature of many humans to want to fit in, so much so that they fight for limitations they don't even have. The concept that we are so free, we choose bondage. At the end of the day, transitioning does not change the sex that you are. All that happens is that you discover how you best operate with gendered societal feedback under the current social conditions of the world as it relates to how men and women typically live and operate and perhaps discover hormonal therapies and cosmetic procedures that jive with your biology and vision for yourself. To say anything more is to misrepresent the benefit that transitioning, whether socially or medically, has to offer to those of us that have done due diligence, I believe. As we continue to explore the concept of self in this abundant environment that fosters creativity, perhaps it would be wisest to focus on appreciation of diversity so as to create more solutions than problems.